You're listening to EdTech Heroes, a podcast that looks at how teachers in today's classrooms can use technology to improve student learning. In each episode, a hero in the world of education will share their story and discuss how innovation can influence the minds of the next generation. Let's jump in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to EdTech Heroes. I'm Neff, and today's guest is Sarah Margison. Sarah is coordinator of Connected Learning at Tippecanoe School Corporation in Indiana. And prior to joining the Tippecanoe Technology Department, Sarah taught high school math for six years. She holds two degrees from Purdue University, including a master's in instructional design and technology. Sarah is a Google certified trainer and certified education technology leader. Sarah, welcome to EdTech Heroes. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. So the new school year is in full swing. And I want to start out by talking about some of the differences between last year and this year from your perspective. What's changed this year and how are you seeing the year evolve? Yeah, I think um, something that's unique in Indiana, I know it's it's unique here versus some other schools around the world and around the states even, is that we were fully in person last year. So mm-hmm. Uh, Last year, it was year one for everybody, right? It was year one of figuring out what it was going to be like to be in person with our students, but then also dealing with this new quarantine, potential remote learning. It was always like this looming, (laughs) like we don't know if we're going to get closed, what's going to happen. Is it going to be a bus driver shortage? Is it going to be so many kids out? That's what last year felt like. So it was always like we were always on our toes with things where this year it's we're still in that same boat. We're still dealing with with remote learning. Potentially, we're still dealing with quarantines. We're still dealing with potential bus driver shortages. But we know what we're going to do if that happens this time. Mm -hmm. So we feel like, okay, well, we've done it before. We know what we didn't like about it last year. We know what we like about it this year. So um, we can make those adjustments. And I feel like it's not it's not year one anymore. You know, nobody's feeling like, oh, this is the, a brand new year. Um, it just feels like, okay, well, we've done this. We can do this. We can survive this. And we can push forward. Um, so that it's it's a little different this year because, of course, last year we didn't know what we didn't know. But this year we know what questions to ask. Um, we know what things might come up and when those things might come up. Um, so that's definitely helping this year. For sure. And I think that we hear from folks that COVID is something that we will deal with for years to come. And yeah. It's somewhat refreshing to hear that although we are in the midst of something that is decidedly bad, we've started to work through and understand how we create efficient systems out of that. Can you talk a little bit about some of the lessons that you learned this year and how you're implementing those? And of course, the lessons that you learned last year as well. What does it look like to survive in this type of environment? Yeah, I think for for my teachers, what I am constantly reminding them is that to try not to plan things that will only work for this year. Mm-hmm. You know, don't 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 waste your time almost planning things that will that you'll have to throw away after this year. So let's be maybe a little bit more intentional about thinking about I always say I want sustainable education. I want what I'm planning to be usable for years to come so that I'm not having to redo things all the time. Um, and so that that has definitely been um, my soapbox this year is, OK, let's let's take out this year. Are there things that we can do that are beneficial for students this year, but that we also might be able to carry with us as the years go on? Because I don't want all this hard work that we've done over the last year to be put away because we think oh, we're, we're not dealing with this at the scale we, w- we were dealing with mm-hmm. it before, you know. 
Yeah, and that's quite a soapbox to be on. And I think it is amazing as an educator to hear a leader say, you know what, let's work smarter and not harder. And let's think about how we can create work-life balance, how we can continue mm -hmm. to iterate and improve on what we've done versus reinventing the wheel every single year, every single quarter. I am curious, when you are preaching to your teachers and you are going on about these renewable resources, what types of lessons and what types of ideas are going to endure regardless of the learning modality? So this idea that I, I have started to, to talk about with these sustainable resources is really, it really started like when I was in the classroom and it mm. started with video and this oh. was 2013 maybe. And so like, we weren't, we weren't using YouTube in the classroom. Like that wasn't, there was no way we were going to unblock YouTube for the kids. Right. <laughs> so this was, but it was video in a format that was usable for my kids. And that's where it started. I was like, wait, I could make a video this year and I could use that same video next year and the year after. And maybe then I just adjust what I'm teaching the kids in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that's that is kind of where it started for me. And then and I, I that's I've continued that preaching is like video, 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 do it all the time because it's fantastic. And, and so then I'm, t I'm reminding teachers and putting in these little nuggets of like, maybe don't say September 28th, you know, mm. maybe make the, make your language more generic in your uh, lessons if you're going to do video or like even, even as simple as like uh, updating their teacher web pages and stuff like, make these things so that we're not having to revisit this every single year that that the content that i have on there is applicable all the time and again then i'm able to focus on the things that i do need to change which is like differentiation for my students you know there are there are um what do i want to say i want to, there are like office style things that i don't have to worry about changing all mm -hmm. the time there's things in my classroom policies and things like that that are going to stay the same but then i can focus my energy on the things that need to change and that's the instruction for the students that's very specific to their needs so that's where my energy can go and not on the if i know that I, as a high school math teacher i was teaching lessons and the content of the lesson wouldn't necessarily change like the concept mm -hmm. was was the same so that's that's sustainable that video is good forever but now i can say okay well now i have this set of kids in my class so what am i going to do with with them that's specific to their needs yeah are you saying that math doesn't change every year <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> All right. Well, we have included lots of tidbits on this show, and I'm going to say that that might be one of the most important ones. Um, but I totally <laughs> get it. And I think that what you're saying is that as people and as educators, we have a finite resource, our time and our effort, right? And we want to think about how we're going to put our time and our effort in the things that mm -hmm. absolutely do need to change. Because to your point, while math is not going to change, combining like terms is going to be the same here in 2021 that it will be in 2042, the students are going to change and how we connect with them does change, right? So tell yeah. me a little bit about how you foster this connection with students. And I know that social emotional learning for both teachers and students is something that is at the forefront of your mind. So when we think about how we connect with students and how we foster this environment that is collective and conducive to learning, what does that look like? Yeah, so there's two parts to that really. Um, the big view from our district um, at our school corporation, we were very lucky four years ago to um, hire a neuroscience educator. And she does a fantastic job of working with our teachers and our students to really put together a an applied educational neuroscience framework into practice in our buildings all the time. And so this like we we've been primed and prepped for this 
this time when we really didn't have the physical connection with each other and sitting in the classroom together, we were ready with some resources and our students and teachers have been prepared with strategies to connect to each other. So that's like the big view, but like, Mm -hmm. okay, so let's talk about like practically what is happening. And personally, my son was quarantined the fourth day of school this school year. Hmm. And we didn't have to be quarantined at all last year. And so he didn't, he didn't really know what was happening. He's a third grader. And and I talked to his teacher on the phone that night that it happened because it, it blew out like half of her class. And I said, what is most important right now is not that the kids are getting the, the content, but that they're getting connection. So let's talk about how you're going to connect with those students while they're at home. Mm-hmm. So we've we've really tried to put tools in our teachers and our students' hands to connect when they're not in the classroom face to face. And so, you know, sending more devices home, um, providing that opportunity for teachers to use video or or mm-hmm. some other way to connect with their students, that is priority number one. And that's what we're hearing from our teachers too is, I can catch Johnny up when he gets back to school with the content, but what's really important is that Johnny feels okay when he's at home, maybe by himself, you know, depending on the Mm -hmm. age of the kid or when he's at home away from his friends. You know, as a third grader, my son did not understand why he couldn't go with his friends. He's he's like, I feel fine. (laughs) What am I supposed to, how are you, how do you explain that to a kid? So providing that connection for them is just, it's super important right now. Absolutely. I I can only imagine the way that your son must have felt and the way that you must have felt as a parent as you are Mm -hmm. helping him through that and helping him understand the sacrifice, frankly, that he is making in order to protect his fellow classmates. So I'm really, really interested in this position of neuroscience educator that you all have at Tip of Canoe. I could be really, (laughs) really wrong here, but I don't think I have ever heard of that position existing within a district. And what better time to have the aid of someone like that. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of the pragmatic tips that that person has put out throughout the district? Yeah. um, And her name is Ann Marshall. I'm going to give her a shout out because she is (laughs) one of my besties and she's super awesome. But um, and I'll send you some resources too that she she shares stuff all the time. But we um, have partnered with some folks at Butler University to to begin this program, and so we have a actually a lot of this work is happening in Indiana. So you might look into some other districts that are doing this. But mm-hmm. I have pulled up um, what she calls her essential agreement, and I'm just going to read uh, a little bit about mm-hmm. um, some of the things that they believe. Um, as part of this applied educational neuroscience. And again, this is applicable for our teachers, students, and staff. So this includes bus drivers and cafeteria workers and technology and everybody in between. Um, And what it says is we cultivate relationships, model and incorporate regulation, teach neuroanatomy, and intentionally address the wellness of our teacher brain states. We know this mind shift is a journey, so we work to be free of judgment and meet one another with compassion as we strive to embody the ideals highlighted below. And then she goes into some more detail about how that actually applies in the classroom. So it's a lot about um, educating students and faculty about um, their their neuroanatomy, mm-hmm. um, making sure that teachers understand that in order to regulate students, they need to be regulated themselves. And so then how do we help our adults regulate so that our adults can help our students regulate? Um, That has been a big topic of conversation at our district. Um, And it's just, it's giving everybody a seat at the table and it's opening the door for these conversations to say, I'm not okay. And here's what I'm feeling. And Mm -hmm. can you help me get through this? Um, and I think that's really helped our teachers and our students. Uh, we always say name it to tame it. So we're putting a name to what they're feeling and then helping them work through that process, you know, whatever those resources look like. Wow. I, 
I think that there is something so profound in any human being able to say, I'm not okay. But I think that it Mm -hmm. is even more profound for a teacher to be able to say this. I don't know about you, Sarah, but in my experience, I think that teachers are often some of the toughest individuals you will ever meet. They will teach through a tornado and not even acknowledge that wind is blowing around them. So to be able to say that in the midst of everything, actually as a human, I'm not okay, has to be something that is incredibly hard for teachers to learn. And it is something that you learn. It's a muscle to be able to name Mm -hmm. an emotion and then be able to think about how you regulate it. Can you talk a little bit about how your district was able to get teachers to a place where they were able to name emotions, especially maybe teachers who had been taught not to do that previously in their careers? (laughs) Yeah, I think it's it's about intention. So being intentional mm-hmm. with our professional development, uh, and we're very we're very lucky at our district to have professional development time built in for our teachers. It's not a lot, but it is something. And so that culture then shifts as we begin to introduce these resources during that professional development time, and then it becomes a part of the language. Well, we also have, as part of our um, human resources department, a, you know, a wellness program. So, you know, working out and drinking water and all that stuff. Well, all of that applied educational neuroscience was coupled with that wellness program so that we could use those resources to get this information out to the teachers. Um, Mm -hmm. And everybody is on the same page. Everybody in every level dealing with any student is on the same page with language and understanding um, what we believe at the TSC about how to regulate students and teachers. And and we have always said from the beginning of this program that teacher brain state is gonna be the most important because if they're Mm -hmm. not okay, it's not gonna be easy for them to make the students okay. So it's just, it's about, it's about change in the culture and it's going to take time. And we know that, um, and not every building is at the same level, but that's okay. And it's just like technology integration, right? Not every building is going to grab it and go, but if we can get into little pockets and Mm -hmm. start to get champions in each building to look at this work and really apply it with their students. I mean, the, proof is in the pudding. So as soon as this stuff gets into classrooms, you're going to see a difference. Mm -hmm. And there was something you said there that I want to pick and kind of elevate a little bit in terms of getting everybody on the same page, regardless of their role. You talked about bus drivers, cafeteria workers, teachers, all being able to understand and implement the same ideas and the same principles. That's really hard, regardless of what those Mm -hmm. principles are, right? So Can you talk to me a little bit about how you all approach professional development and how you allow every employee of TSC to be able to be on the same page, even if there are different levels to being on the same page, to your point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of times districts will focus on teacher professional development, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's obvious that we need teacher professional development time, but we don't always prioritize, we'll call it staff professional development time. So those folks that are not in a certified position that would be required to do professional development for a license or something, how do we prioritize that? And that really starts at the district level and it starts with those directors. We have directors of food service and directors of transportation and technology and all of that. And so those folks understanding that they need to build in the time, prioritize the professional learning for their departments is really important. We're looking at our district has nearly 1600 employees. So Mm -hmm. it's really important for us to prioritize professional learning 
at every level, no matter what that profession actually is. And so that, again, it's just something that's built into the culture here. We look at, you know, bringing in our bus drivers for half day trainings on whatever. So there was, when we switched to Gmail, we did a half day training just on Gmail because Mm -hmm. our bus drivers might only be checking their email every now and then. So do they know how to get onto it? And and so it was the same thing when Anne started working with within the district for this neuroscience stuff. It was like, okay, I need to get in front of this group of people. I haven't met their needs yet. And so how do I, I need to work with this director and make sure that it's a priority. And so it's a matter of time and it's a matter of space. Do we have the time to meet with the the folks and that comes from the director and then do we have the space to meet with them so that we can all kind of get together and work on these things and luckily um you know google meet in our district has been really popular over the last year and a half (laughs) and so that has blown up that space it's really just provided us so much more that we're able to connect with folks easily uh, because we can send things out, we can record things, we can meet virtually. We don't necessarily have to have all the bodies in the building at the same time. For sure, for sure. And I think one of the interesting things that you're saying is this differentiation piece, this personalization piece that we talked about at the top of the episode when it applies to students mm-hmm is also something that applies to doing professional learning effectively, right? Like we're differentiating based off Mm -hmm. of the role that this person has in the district, based off of their level of technology proficiency or proficiency with anything that we might be covering. And I think that that, Mm in and of itself is somewhat innovative. We we think a lot about how we facilitate that in the classroom, but I think sometimes we come into professional development and we say, okay, everybody's in the room and we're going to operate in whole group instruction and teach them the exact same thing. And that might not meet the individualized needs of all of the folks within the building or within the district. One of the other things that you said is that professional learning, at least at Tippica New, has has looked a lot different this last year and a half than it did previously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you aren't necessarily trying to stuff everybody into one school or into one classroom. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of this innovation in professional learning and what that has made possible? Yeah, so I started my position six years ago and mm-hmm. most of my job was planning and providing professional development for 30 minute blocks at the beginning of the day in the schools. And so it was whole group. And even six years ago, we were like, okay, this is good because I, I don't want to, to downplay whole group too much Mm -hmm. because I will say this from our district level, we have 20 buildings. And so what's really important from the technology department is that every building hears the same base Mm -hmm. level information. Everybody gets the same base level because I don't want a building to be running so far ahead and I have not even seen the other building. So everybody gets that base level whole, whole group. And so even six years ago, we were saying, okay, well, how do we take it a step further for those folks that are ready? Or how do we pull it back for those folks Mm -hmm. that were not ready for that whole group that needed something prior to that? What do we do? So we tried to do webinars six years ago with the staff and it just wasn't wasn't really gaining traction, just wasn't happening. And then everything shut down in March of 2020. And we thought, this is the moment. This is the moment that we prepared for to provide these webinars. And Mm -hmm. so we started to do that because they had no other choice but to watch a video of us. So we did we did some live, we did some recorded, but it was webinars on the tools that that they were going to be able to use to teach their students in this pandemic. So we just saw this huge increase of teachers watching our webinars and we thought, okay, so this is this is good now. Mm-hmm. So last year we're back in person, but we're not quite ready to do whole group um, professional development again. So we kept with our webinars. So we that sort of evolved and we would release at least two webinars a month on various topics and we'd 
publish them in a newsletter. We put them out on our YouTube channel. And again, we're just trying to uh, give everybody something, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody had, there was, there was really easy stuff. There was very difficult things. There was kind of borderline things. So it was just a little bit of everything. And so that differentiation was huge because we were able to meet everyone's needs. And I had teachers requesting things. They never requested whole group instruction topics. They all, but I had teachers requesting, Hey, can you do a webinar on this? They never watched a webinar prior to March 2020, (laughs) but now we've got teachers watching webinars and I'm like, this is fantastic. And for me, it's so easy that I can record it and I can send it to all 20 buildings and I only had to do one recording. Mm -hmm. So then this year, so we're starting this, this new year and I'll be honest, I missed being in front of them whole group. Mm. It was something that it was the connection piece for me. It was me being able to see all of their faces and connect with them and just get updates from them, right? It doesn't doesn't have to be heavy content, but just to be out in the building and check in with them. And so we have now, we're doing both. We're doing whole groups still, and we're doing webinars, and we're starting to go into classrooms, so meeting with teachers individually. But I think what we've seen over the last year and a half is that teachers feel more comfortable for our team saying, this is what I want. This Mm -hmm. is what I need. So it's not just the topic, but it's the delivery method. I don't want a webinar. I want a how-to document that has screenshots Mm -hmm. in it. Or I want you to come into my classroom and show me how to do this. Or can you just send me whatever, you know, so they're asking because I think we've given them a taste of the different types of professional development that we can provide. And so now they're like, oh, I like that type. And so can you provide this information in that form? So it's just been, it's been really fun to see the evolution of that over the last year and a half. Very cool. And have you noticed any sort of trends around most teachers seem to really enjoy webinars or most teachers seem to really enjoy these how-to documents or does it really run the gamut? It runs, honestly, it runs the gamut. And um, I have some teachers that they do really well just one-on-one individually. Mm -hmm. And then some teachers that they just need a little bit of support from me, but they are self-starters. They're going to go, go, go with Mm -hmm. the information. Um, And so they just need real quick support. They don't, they don't really need me. Right. Um, And then, so then I can focus my time on, on those teachers that need me uh, need a little more of my time and, and all of that. But I think we are, we are definitely seeing a lot more teachers engaging in our webinars and, or requesting that kind of information. Uh, And, and so then we're trying to be intentional too about how long those webinars are Mm -hmm. and what kind of information we cover and do we break it up into smaller chunks so that they can kind of pick and choose what they learn about, you know, about that particular topic. For sure. And I love that you all are analyzing your instructional practices from a professional learning and professional development perspective. So how do you all decide that a change might be necessary? So if you run a webinar with 500 typical new teachers and it lasted 45 minutes what are you and your team doing after that webinar to say that was the perfect length or maybe it needs to be longer or it sounds like sometimes saying no we actually need to break that into smaller chunks what data are you analyzing to be able to make those instructional decisions yeah most of it is anecdotal i mean our teachers are not shy about sharing their (laughs) feelings, but that's because we have told them, you need to tell us, you need to Mm -hmm. give us feedback. Mm -hmm. So we have always had an open door, answer our phone type of policy here. And we really try to utilize like our instructional coaches too, that are actually housed in our buildings to say, what are you hearing? And I think the other thing that we that we kind of take for granted sometimes too, is being a part of your school's community. Mm 
So Mm -hmm. my kids go to one of the schools that I serve. So that means that when I'm at soccer games and at baseball games, I am with the teachers that I work with professionally. Mm -hmm. And that is huge for relationship and for them trusting that if they express their concerns to me, that I'm going to take it and I'm going to do something productive with that concern. And that, and that goes, that's across the board. So that's everybody in our department. A lot of us are, we live in this community. We are friends with these teachers. And that is, I think that's the biggest thing for us. And that's the biggest benefit. I did not start living in, I did not start this job living in this community. I I spent two years and I was not a part of this district. And when I moved here and moved my kids into these schools, that changed for me. That definitely opened the door to those relationships where the teachers feel like, hey, I saw her on the weekend. I can just mention to her that I'm struggling with this. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not me, that they feel like they can tell that to and Marshall or to one of our instructional coaches. And then those instructional coaches that I'm now friends with can come to me and say, Hey, we have a teacher that's struggling with X, Y, Z. And then I can come in and support that. In fact, last year, um, we had a teacher that was just struggling with her students were eating lunch in the classroom just because Mm -hmm. of um, distancing and COVID, uh, they were potentially having recess in the classroom because we're Indiana and it gets really cold here. Mm-hmm. And then having all of their instruction in the classroom and sometimes having the specials in the classroom. So that meant mm. they never left her room. And so it was just, you could tell that it was taking a toll on her. And so this is not a technology need. She doesn't have a technology need, but what we were able to do is partner together. And I went in and just said, Hey, Give me 30 minutes with your kids and let me teach them a new tool. You leave, take a breath, take a minute. I will, I got this, <laughs> you know, let me take these kids and just teach them something that you could pro- have probably taught them, but this just gives you a moment to take a breath. And we would have never known that if we didn't have those relationships with those teachers. Absolutely. So it sounds like there is an emphasis on not only teaching the whole child, but also serving the whole teacher. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. And I would imagine that that also required a mindset shift for folks like you who sit at the district where In some instances, you might be able to say, I'm the director of food services, so I'm going to worry about food. And you could easily say that I am the coordinator of connected learning, so I'm going to help you with technology needs, and that's where my job starts and ends. But it sounds like that's not the case at TSC. It really is, I am someone who is working to be able to improve the lives of teachers and students in any way that I might be able to do that. Yeah, I I think I'm better at my job if I understand what resources are available fully to the teachers. And if I make those connections across to our student services department and to our Mm -hmm. curriculum instruction department, if I make those connections to know that this type of service is available to our teachers that makes me better at my job and i always had a dream to be in a position where i could just help teachers get better Mm -hmm. at what they do and i didn't know what that was going to look like and it ended up looking like technology support but that could have looked any way it really could have been any kind of professional development position. It didn't necessarily have to be a topic of technology. And so that's how I've always looked at things is my background is in education. It's not, I ha- I have this degree with technology, but that's just, that's extra, right? <laughs> so it's, it's about you as the teacher getting better at what you do. If it happens to involve technology, great, I'm here for that. (laughs) But if it doesn't, I'm not going to force it either, you know, and and that's always how I've thought about technology integration, too. It's just we don't need to force it. So it's really about understanding all of the resources that are available to our teachers and then being able to plug those resources in as somebody who just supports those adults. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think I speak for myself and probably every teacher listening that you sound absolutely amazing and it would be awesome to come (laughs) over to TSC um, and be a part of not only what you have done, but frankly, it sounds like what the entire district has done to be able to prioritize teachers, students, staff members, parents, and everybody in between. Before we wrap up our discussion, we have a segment here, which is my favorite, where we ask every single one of our heroes, which you now are, for some tips for teachers. As we've talked, it's clear that you are absolutely amazing at helping your colleagues be able to advocate for themselves. Would you mind giving a tip for the teachers listening as to how they might start that practice of advocating for themselves and figuring out what they need to improve their practice? Yeah, I think first it's understanding and acknowledging that you might need help and that it's okay if you might need help. Um, Then figuring out what what is what does that help look like Um, and then reaching out to the people that you trust to say, are you the person that can help me with this? Or is there somebody that you know that can help me with this? Um, Many times in my position, this breaks my heart to hear this, but many times in my position I hear, I don't wanna bother you. Mm. And I always remind teachers that it's my job to help them, that it's never an interruption, it's never a bother, it's an opportunity for me to make a connection with them, and that is what fuels me. So this is something that like, I try to phrase it as somebody that might be providing the help, that you're doing me a favor by asking Mm -hmm. me for something because it gets me out of my office, it allows me to use my resources and use that, I have something that many of our teachers don't have, and that's time. I have Mm. flexibility in time in my schedule to be able to say, I'm going to prioritize this right now. And our teachers don't have that. And so it's really understanding the people around you that can provide that support. And I think even just teachers leaning on teachers to say, I need a minute right now. Um, But it all boils down to acknowledging that it's okay if we can't do it all, even though we really Mm want to do it all. (laughs) It's okay that we can't do it all. And who are the people around me that can help support me? And maybe that's just an honest conversation that you have, like with your grade level team or something like that. It's like, okay, let's all make a pact (laughs) or an essential agreement to be there for each other and no questions asked we don't need details what do you need something right now do you need 10 minutes right now okay let me give you that let me support you in this moment okay do you need help with is this thing frustrating in your classroom okay i know somebody that can come in and help and so you just start to build your network of people that can come around you and carry you when you need it For sure, for sure. And I love the suggestion of potentially starting small. Maybe for some listeners, there is not someone at the district that they can confide in yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, potentially there is someone in their school building. And, And you're right, there is so much emphasis on yet because I think what you've described is this two way building of relationships. Obviously you're out there mm-hmm. building relationship with, with teachers, but they're also out there building relationships with you. So teachers who said, I can't confide in Sarah yet are now able to confide in you and ask for help when they mm-hmm. might need it. Final question for you. Yeah, what and I think are, for... you go for it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, if anybody is listening and they're at the district level, communicate to your teachers that it's that they can feel safe telling you things, that it's, you know, that there is an agreement that whatever they share with you is not going to leave the room, especially Mm -hmm. if you're at the district level, because I think sometimes that's the misconception that we go back and we're like telling everybody everything. And it's like, that's not the case. I want to know that you are well in in your job and that when I leave your school, you feel better than when I got there. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Final question for you. 
after that amazing tidbit that I think goes both ways, both for folks who sit in your position and for teachers who might be looking for a lifeline. But final question, what are some of your favorite online resources to share with teachers and where can listeners find you? Well, I'll have to give a shout out to Screencastify because that is actually one of my favorites. Uh, I use it. I use it constantly, not just as like a former teacher, but like mm-hmm. as somebody who does professional development. I actually just I, we had to cancel a professional development because we had a busing shortage or staffing shortage. So like the buses mm-hmm. were all messed up. And so I said, let me do a little Screencastify. I'm going to add in some questions and I'll send it out to your staff. And it was fantastic. So that's that is definitely in my top three. Um, the next one that I love is Canva. I am a design person, and so I'm using Canva constantly. And if you're a teacher, Canva for Education, you get a free account. You can give mm-hmm. access to your students. It's it's amazing. It's awesome. I It's like the thing that just fills me with joy to be able to like create these beautiful looking graphics and presentations and all that stuff in Canva. Um, and then I don't know if I have a third one. I think those probably are my top two. And if somebody were to ask, like, oh, what do you think Sarah's top – tech tools are they're going to be like canva and screencastify because that's all that she talks about so (laughs) those are definitely my top two (laughs) and then folks can find me on twitter i am at tsc connect that's the best way to get a hold of me i'm post anytime i post a webinar i also post that on twitter Um, our youtube channel is tsc connected learning team we post it as a team um, on that YouTube channel. So if you're re- ever looking for professional learning resources, please, we, we would love to have you as a, wa- a viewer. You don't even have to be a part of TSC. We share everything freely. So, you, you know, feel free to find us. And if you've got questions, I've um, answered questions from other districts before because I know not everybody has resources. And so we're happy to provide anything that we can to help. That is amazing. Sarah, I really appreciate you joining EdTech Heroes. And teachers, be sure to follow Sarah on Twitter at TSC Connect, which is awesome because you'll be a part of the professional learning community and get to check in on some of those awesome webinars she spoke about throughout our podcast. I am your host, Neff, and I will see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of EdTech Heroes, presented by Screencastify.